is like when a kid is having a hard time, are we looking at them like they're a bad kid doing bad things? Or are we looking at them like they're a good kid having a hard time? Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today, we welcome Dr. Becky Kennedy to the show. Dr. Becky is a clinical psychologist and mom of three, recently named the Millennial Parenting Whisperer by Time Magazine. She specializes in parenting and child development with an emphasis on anxiety and resilience. Dr. Becky received her BA in Psychology and Human Development from Duke University and her PhD in Clinical Psychology from Columbia University. Her latest book is called Good Inside, A Guide to Becoming the Parent You Want to Be. In this episode, I talked to Dr. Becky about good parenting. Raising children is no easy task. As a mom herself, Dr. Becky knows what that's like. Her parenting philosophy revolves around seeing the good inside every child and seeing the sturdy leader in every parent. She shares actionable advice on how to repair emotional connection after conflict, how to reduce shame, and how we can break unhealthy generational patterns. We also touch on the topics of genetics, resilience, attachment, and self-care. Dr. Becky is awesome. I really enjoy chatting with her, and I really like her no-nonsense manner in which she gives advice to parents. It's not only no-nonsense, but it's also quite compassionate. She really has compassion for everyone involved, in parent and children, and believes in the ultimate good of all people. So, without further ado, I bring you Dr. Becky. Hi, so you're a clinical psychologist. Um, and uh, you got your PhD from Columbia. Very nice, very nice. Um, can I ask who your advisor was? Yeah, my advisor was Lena Verdelli. Okay, and what was your specialization then? Well, I actually started with Sunia Luther um, under kind of resilience and adolescence, um, and then ended up shifting. Uh, she left, it was a whole thing. So then worked with Lena around um, evidence-based kind of the difference between like evidence-based and non-evidence-based kind of focused psychology PhD programs. Nice. Yeah. Did you go to Columbia? Nice. No, I, I'm a professor at Columbia now, oh. but I um, <laughs> but I did my PhD at Yale. Nice. But yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so at what point did you, you know, because you've really carved out quite a niche for yourself. I mean, you're, you're, you're so popular. <laughs> <laughs> helping parents. My, my helping, ego, thanks yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I went on Instagram. I was like, oh, what, how many followers does she have? <laughs> over a million. You're like Justin Bieber status over there <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the parenting world. Now, how did that happen? Like, can you just tell me a little bit more about like your trajectory to to the to the point of where you are today and in, in, in this what you study? Yeah. yeah, I guess it all starts when I realized you know, you can make a living or, you know, a career out of getting to know people, essentially. It was always my favorite thing to do, ask a lot of questions, learn about their family. Um, and so I went to Columbia for my PhD and had just so many amazing advisors, so much amazing clinical experience working at inpatient hospital, working in forensic at Bellevue, um, working with kids, doing play therapy, um, working with, you know, intensive personality uh, disorder institute, so many different things. And then I finished at Columbia and did my postdoc at Columbia's counseling center just across the street where I really love that kind of college age kind of population, grad school population. And soon after that, I got, I got pregnant during my postdoc year. And so I finished my postdoc in August and had my first son that following October. So Okay. I, and then after that, I realized, you know, I, I knew I wanted to go back to work and I wanted to have a private practice to have some flexibility and kind of create some deep relationships. And so open up a private practice. And then, you know, my kind of interest in working with adults in intensive psychotherapy started to really overlap with my interest in like everything that was happening as a parent. Cause what I thought was just so interesting, was like, oh, like being a parent is so hard. Like I should know about this. I do know about this. And yet it's not always connecting the dots for me. And so I loved, um, I loved working with parents and kind of doing more active, almost some parent coaching. And so went to get more training at that point and kind of signed up for this fairly like behavioral, behavior focused, evidence-based parenting program. And I did it. And honestly, at first I loved it. I really, really did. It just like lit up all the logical linear parts of my brain. And then really, it was one day in my private practice, I was like in the middle of a session with someone giving them advice about how to do it right now. And I seriously, I stopped. I was like, you know what? 
I was just like, I don't believe what I'm saying to you. <laughs> they were like <laughs> horrified. And I was like, I just, I hear myself saying something I wouldn't do with my own kid and I haven't figured it out yet because I've taken this program and like I, and some part of me believes this, but like I, it doesn't feel right coming out. And then it, it really led to me thinking about like all these ways I work with adults in intensive psychotherapy and the ways that they're rewiring some of their earliest patterns. And I kept thinking like, well, what if my parent coaching philosophy and approach and strategies were actually just in line? with my like deep psychotherapy approach and practice and strategies, except that they'd be like adapted to be reverse engineered to kids, you know, instead of to 30, 40, 50 year old adults. And that just got me started. And then I literally kind of like randomly started an Instagram account. And that was, you know, a little over two years ago. And here I am now talking to you on your awesome podcast. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so it just it just clicked with um with so many parents. I mean, you have so many ideas that are so resonant. Is there maybe a common thread that you can think of that really re- rethinks the way we uh, raise our children? Yeah, you know, I, I've been asked that question a bunch of times, and I really mean it. This is the first time I think I have a good answer because you know it just takes a while to like Yay. collect your thoughts. I'm honored. Yeah, <laughs> good timing. Like, yeah. you know what it is. I really think the good inside approach, here's like the dirty little secret, is is it honors and respects and helps a parent like as much, maybe even a little more sometimes, than it honors and respects and helps develop a, a child. Like if, and if I think about parenting, you know, it's something we hear from a lot of parents, especially the moms, although I'm biased because more moms are kind of part of our membership you know, than, than fathers yeah. is yeah. I, I'm losing myself. I'm depleted. I'm so, I care about my kids. I love my kids so much. Maybe even I'm a work inside the home parent and like these other parts of me, like they're neglected. Like I haven't seen them in years and not surprisingly, they, you know, scream out in the form of mom rage ever, every, you know, so often. And I feel like one of the things with good inside is it's like, oh, I'm, I'm getting quote parenting advice. And yeah, like someone said this to me, they're like, you capture our attention through tricky situations with our kids. But people, I think what I hear over and over is they're like, I have grown as a person like so much. Then I actually am able to be more grounded and more confident and more sturdy so I can actually use the strategies for my kids because before that I learned them, but then in the moment they never came to me. But like the biggest benefit to me is like, I feel (laughs) like I have healed and grown in this journey. And I think it's really a parenting approach that sees a parent and helps a parent and helps really bring out the sturdy leader inside of a parent. It's really not only something kind of like everything else that's for your kid. It just makes so much sense why that would resonate with the parents. (laughs) I mean, they're exhausted, as you say. And and I think like along with that, right, there's like this duality, I think that like I see a lot. So it's like this is as much for you as your kid. And also I think a lot of models around kind of parenting – like there's this inherent choice. Okay. Either I like do kind of prioritize my needs and I end up interacting with my kid in a way that I feel firm. I feel like authoritarian. I don't like the version of myself. Like I've never met a parent who's like, I love giving timeouts. I feel so great after I send my kid to their room or I love threatening them. And I really love taking away TV. I just feel so empowered. Like I've never heard that. Like it feels shitty to everyone, but they're like, I have to get my kid to be eight. Right. So you're like, Okay, I don't even think it does get that, but at least in theory, you're like, I'm being firm, I'm being hard, I'm being this like authority, Um, but it doesn't feel good. And you also know you're like not actually creating a meaningful relationship with your kid. So that's one side. And then there's this other side that's like some version of like, feel the feelings, just like the feelings are okay. I think a lot of parents are like, okay, but like, when we're in a grocery store and my kid's like feeling the feelings and like you know, knocking over all the boxes of cereal, like, what do I do? Because it doesn't. How does that help? <laughs> right, exactly. So it's either like I honor my kid's feelings and I maybe I'm building connection with them, or I like put up these kind of authoritarian, controlled kind of approach in which I'm like only focused on behavior. But there, I don't really feel connected to my kids. And I really don't feel that connected to myself, right? So it feels like there's been this choice. And I think like every one of our strategies that comes from like a really grounded theoretical framework, like gives parents the ability to embody their 
sturdy leadership, embody their authority. That doesn't mean being mean. It's through like embodying your authority the way the leader of a company would embody their authority while building stronger connections to their kids. Like both are happening. And I know as a parent, like me too, I'm like, oh, good. Like I'm glad there's something between those two kind of like really not that compelling buckets. And I think that's also really striking a chord with parents. Yeah, you you really are combining uh, two things that that needed combining or inter- no sorry integrating is is a, is a better word for it. So, do you draw on um, the science of positive psychology at all? Do you draw on the science of resiliency? Um, it sounds like you're you're picking things that were in the adult literature and you're applying it, it to parenting, which is quite novel. So, yeah, yeah if you talk a little more about who you, where you draw from, definitely. So, if I think if I think about this period when I I really like had this. I don't know, it was like, it was too early to be a midlife crisis, but it felt like that. It's like, wait, I don't believe in all these parenting things. Like, I, what, do, what do I believe in? Who am I? You know, and I was like, okay, just start with one thing I know. Like, what do I know? Well, I feel pretty good about how I work with adults. And I think my framework for all the work I did with adults was something like this. Adults come in with a set of symptoms. They call them problems, right? And I really do believe symptoms in adulthood were all adaptations in childhood. Like, that's why I don't love diagnosis, because I feel like we pathologize a presentation in an adult that was a set of adaptations. Like, I feel like someone internally in the body is like, hello, I was trying to help you, you know? Um, Yeah. And so people, we wire in a certain way in our childhood, right? We develop pattern ways of thinking and we develop, you know, procedural knowledge, all in an attempt to adapt and thrive in our earliest environment. Then fast forward 20 years, well, guess what? Probably those ways are not actually adaptive in the general world, but understandably, and in my mind with gratitude, our body is hesitant to let go of the things that were put in place to protect us. So that really drives my work. Then how did I work with adults after that? Like to me, it's a combination of a lot of things because a lot of people who know me will be like, oh, you're a CBT therapist, you know? I'm not a CBT therapist. I've never been trained really formally in CBT. I'm a very practical therapist. I use a lot of very practical strategies because I think people need to bridge insight and change with actual like doing things, you know, and take Mm -hmm. experiments. But what most inspires me has always been internal family systems. Like I could wax poetic about internal family systems. I love that approach, yes. I'm obsessed. Um, Anything more somatically oriented, mindfulness is like a star somatic experiencing. I like definitely draw from body work. Um, And then I do draw from positive psychology for sure. And the idea that like someone's coming in because something that was a strength for them, something that was an adaptation is no longer working. But like we have to learn the story of that and figure out how to help that person continue to use those strengths, but just in a way that's more adaptive now that they're an adult. And so what that makes me think about in terms of parenting is then, okay, well, let me, let me now look back at now we have a five-year-old. If I really do believe that kind of struggles in adulthood were adaptations in childhood, and I really do believe in, oh, sorry, I didn't say like probably the biggest influence for me has always been like attachment theory, right? And for everyone listening, I know you know this, but that's not the same as attachment parenting, attachment theory. Um, then like kids are trying to adapt. Like, this is like, I keep coming back to this, like, they're trying their best. Like, no five-year-old who's completely dependent on their parent to survive is trying to mess up their attachment relationship so that they're abandoned and left alone on the street. Like, no one's trying to do that. That just wouldn't be evolutionarily possible. So then I feel like I just get curious about kids. Well, why, if kids are trying to do their best, then why do so many kids do, like, so many annoying things, like, all the time, right? And that really informed my lens right? Especially it's like it, kids are trying to maximize for attachment safety and they're trying to figure themselves out. And I think there's then this like almost like framework shift that I think about a ton with parenting is like when a kid is having a hard time, are we looking at them like they're a bad kid doing bad things or are we looking at them like they're a good kid having a hard time? And I actually think that's the starting point for the entire approach we have. Because when you're punishing a kid or sending them away, you're saying something, I've said these things too. I'm like, what's wrong with you? Why can't you be more generous like your sister? You're so selfish. I'm looking at my kid who's not sharing their snack with their sister as a bad kid doing bad things. 
if I step in and say, look, I told you those snacks were to share. It looks like you're having a really hard time sharing. I know you're not going to like this. I am going to take that bowl from your hand so I can divvy up the snacks between you and your sister. Something must be going on for you. And we'll figure that out later. For now, I'm going to step between you. Well, first of all, there's nothing about that approach that's like soft or like anything goes. It's actually very, I think, again, bodying of your authority. But I'm looking at my kid as having a hard time. They're a good kid having a hard time. They're trying to do their best and their best still isn't so safe or isn't so great. And so I need to step in. And that's what I think really is almost the foundation of like every everything we end up recommending when kids are struggling is like they're a good kid underneath. Their behavior is not an indication of their identity. It's an indication of a struggle they're having. Mostly they're through that behavior saying like, I really need your help. I need your help now to help me stop. And I definitely need your help outside of the fact to help me build skills I clearly didn't have so I can show up differently the next time. The trauma, loss, and uncertainty of our world have led many of us to ask life's biggest questions, such as who are we? What is our highest purpose? And how do we not only live through, but thrive in the wake of tragedy, division, and challenges to our fundamental way of living? To help us all address these questions, process what this unique time in human history has meant for us personally and collectively, and emerge whole, I've collaborated with my colleague and dear friend, Dr. Jordan Feingold, MD, to bring you our forthcoming book. It's called Choose Growth, a workbook for transcending trauma, fear, and self-doubt. It's a workbook designed to guide you on a journey of committing to growth and the pursuit of self-actualization every day. It's chock full of research from humanistic psychology, positive psychology, developmental psychology, personality psychology, cognitive science, and neuropsychology. So lots of themes that you hear about on this podcast. And it's aimed to help us all integrate the many facets of ourselves and co-create our new normal with a renewed sense of strength, vitality, and hope. Whether you're healing from loss, adapting to the new normal, or simply looking ahead to life's next chapter, Choose Growth will help steer you there to deeper connection to your values, your life vision, and ultimately your most authentic self. Choose Growth will officially hit the shelves September 13th, and you can order your copy or the audiobook in the U.S. now on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, IndieBound, and all major retailers. If you're in the U.K. and Commonwealth, you can order now at bookshop.org.uk. We truly hope this book helps you grow and thrive and become your best self. Okay, now back to the show. It's a very compassionate approach. Um, I'm not sure I agree <laughs> that every kid is good underneath. What do you do with like little monsters? You know, and like I feel like you're 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 um you would you would never even say said use such a phrase because you just said they're all good underneath. But there are some kids. There are some kids who are like um you know callous on emotional traits, which is the precursor to psycho adult psychopath. So it, from your compassionate lens. What do you? What is your advice to a parent who is raising a child who is showing those clinical callous on emotional traits at a very young age at, within your framework? Look, uh, I, I I would defend you know to my core that I think there's like internal goodness. I really really do. I love that. That doesn't I love mean that. that everything is excusable, right? That like at all, like mm. those two things. And again, I think so many times we convert. Like people will be like. Oh, so he's a good kid. So it's okay that he's just punching his friend on the playground. Like, no, what, why? Why are only two choices that he's a bad kid or that it's okay? Like, I don't, I don't buy that binary. You know. So what would I say if a family came to me and they're like, "Look, my seven-year-old seems to have like no empathy for anyone. Like, they seem totally out for themselves. They seem, I don't know, yeah. so callous. Like, they've never seemed to care about anyone else. Like, how would I?" Yeah. You know, it, it's hard to like conjecture, like, because I don't think I'd be like, well, oh, cool. I'm glad you came in. Here's like the five steps, you know, to bring out the good inside. Yeah. Like, you know, but right. I do, I do believe, of course, kids have come into the world with like temperaments and predispositions. And I also believe kids then interact in their environment. And through those interactions, certain things are more or less likely to get more expressed, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? There's a temperament, personality times environment interaction. And so, my approach with parents, and this is like, you know, I always say like, I don't think it's your fault that your kid is the way they are. I really mean that. Like, I actually don't think it's your fault. And I think it is your responsibility to get to know your kid and to think about the environment that your unique child, you know, needs to develop in like the best way as is possible for your child. 
And what I mean by your responsibility is, you know, like we would never, if a, if a CEO was running a company and having a lot of employees who are like, I don't know, coming in late or whatever, we would never say that like the change starts with the associates. We'd be like, something's going on in the culture. And like, it's not necessarily your fault that everyone's coming in late. Like there could be a million factors. Change does start with you as the top of that pyramid. Right. And so that's like the way I would approach it with a parent. So what would that mean? I mean, I'd get to know that more. I'd want to know more. Well, what is the way, what happens when this kid does display this like lack of empathy? What are they doing outside the moment to build empathy? I think a lot of people think we build empathy in a way that does not all build empathy and actually builds guilt and shame, which then can mask empathy later on. So I'd be curious if they're constantly saying to this kid, look how upset you made her. Look how she's crying. Don't you care about her crying, which to me, like, that is not how anybody actually develops empathy. That's how people develop feeling really shitty about themselves and cold hearted. I think this also brings another point that I think is really inherent in general, the good inside, is I really believe that we have to be able to see things in our kids before they're able to see those things in themselves. And kids know how their parents look at them. And I don't know if you, I'm sure you've maybe heard of this phrase or something like it. I am as I am seen, right? That's like that attachment relationship. That's the idea of a parent as a mirror. Well, if we are constantly reflecting back to our kid that they are a monster without empathy, if we're saying those things, if we're looking at them in those ways, if we're interpreting their behavior through that lens, well, that is how they identify over time more and more and more. And again, does that mean a parent need a kid that way? It really doesn't. It's much more nuanced than that. But it does mean that starting to intervene differently and have a different framework uh, like will have a really big impact yeah. on a child. I mean, think about how awful it is as an eight-year-old or as a four-year-old yeah. to be looked at by adults, by your caregivers. Like you are just, you know, years away from becoming a sociopath. Like that's, <laughs> right. that's really, that's really fucking sad. That's really it's even sad. harder for a 50-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right? Yeah. If they're diagnosed. Look, this is very compassionate of you. And it's a very, um, uh, it's compassion of all sides, the child, children, as well as the parents who have to deal with it. You know, it can be very hard, a lot to deal with for, for some parents. So, some children are easier for parents than others. We have to admit that. Oh, oh my God. Beyond. <laughs> I actually think, you know, I think it's, it's really interesting. Like I have three kids, right? And I really believe each of my kids like needs a different parent. And I don't mean like they actually need to be farmed out to a different family, although sometimes it feels like everyone would benefit, you know, from, from that. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, what I mean is like, they each need me to like lead with a different part of myself. Like I really like for, to, to have the right match and look, and going back to the work and the parent, like that's really hard work. That's exhausting. And if anybody listening is like, I do have that kid who seems like they really don't care about anyone's feelings. I feel for you as the parent, like Of course, it's the most reactive, easy thing to say, like, what's wrong with you? Are you a psychopath? Of course. And like, if I were in your shoes, I'd be saying the same thing sometimes. And hopefully I'd catch myself, repair when I could, and a little bit more often try to intervene in a slightly different way. So yes, it's, it's so, it's so hard. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So it can be absolutely. Um, And I really like how you distinguish very clearly, clearly between your principle of internal goodness and um, the fact that uh, this doesn't mean that anything goes. Um, you, you said that earlier when you said you know you're not you're not you're not like uh, blaming or you're you're not like uh, excusing excusing uh, bad behavior, but you still stick by this principle of internal goodness. In a way, it's quite consistent with um, my own humanistic psychology approach. You know, of to adults. Yeah. You know, which is uh, you at least try to. Uh, in, in uh, yeah, I'm a big believer in Carl Rogers' unconditional positive regard. I don't know to what extent you are familiar with that uh, concept, but it seems in line with the principle of internal goodness. It is. You know, I always think about anything I have, like something of a principle around, I always feel like and I want to turn it into a strategy because I, I always hate, and I, I've been to so many psych events like this where I'm like, that's so interesting, whatever someone's saying. And then I'm like, how do I do it? Like, I need to know when I walk out of this room how to do the thing and put into action. And to me, the idea of being good inside, you know, put into a strategy is something I call MGI, like the most generous interpretation, which is really in line with Carl Rogers, you know, um, ideas. Yeah. So it's a powerful intervention. Like even if anyone listening right now is like, okay, this thing happened with my kid or with your partner or with yourself, like, oh, I told them not to eat before dinner and they grabbed chocolate anyway, right? Most of us can come up with what I call an LGI, a least generous interpretation, 
so quickly. Oh, my son doesn't respect me. And you're like, whoa, <laughs> like, I don't even know. Like, it's just so easy. And just ask, like, what is the most generous interpretation of what happened? Like our whole framework shifts. And that framework shift allows us to intervene differently. That allows us to look at our kid differently. That allows our kid to look at themselves differently. And how kids yeah. learn to look at themselves also becomes how they start to look at other people, right? So it's a really, it, it's a huge impact. Yeah, huge. All these feedback cycles, <laughs> there's so many. You're right. Um, you're right. Uh, you, you said something earlier that I thought was really interesting. You said, well, it's not the parents' fault. Um, you know, you don't want to blame the parents for how the, the child is acting at age six. Uh, you, first of all, you reminded me of the Philip Larkin uh, poem, this, uh, this Be the Verse. I don't know if you're familiar with nah, it. I need to be, though. Uh, they fuck you up, your mom oh, and dad. Yes, yes. They may not mean to, but they do. They fill you with the faults they had and add some extra just for you. But they were fucked up in their turn by fools in old style hats and coats who half the time were soppy stern and half at one another's throats. Man hands on misery to man. It deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as early as you can and don't have any kids yourself. <laughs> so, no, hopeful. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't think that's your message. No. <laughs> that's the opposite of your message. That's the opposite of your message. In terms of... um. The nature nurture debate, though, there is the one. I think that uh, what you're saying is is correct um, to a certain degree. It, it, it is a parent's fault in the sense they are giving the child their genes to a certain degree, um, but that's that's not something you can blame a parent for. You know, like consciously, they didn't intentionally do that. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I guess I I really do believe this. I really do believe that people are doing the best they can with the resources they have available in that moment, and. What I would think about intergenerationally or even, okay, so, oh, uh, because this happens a lot. We have a lot of people, you know, take some of our workshops or, and it's a really, I feel like it's a really vulnerable, brave thing to be open to learning because like learning something new, even an idea, like as much as it could help you change, it can also really shut you down with like shame. Like, oh fuck, I'm a horrible person. Like, I can't believe I didn't know that. Or what kind of parent would have done the things I already did? So I always feel like it's so brave to even be open to learning right? But I do think it's true. Like we, like every parent loves their kid. Like you want to change the way you're parenting your six-year-old or you feel like, wow, like my six-year-old's struggling. They must need something different. Like I think we can say for those six years, I was doing the best I could with the resources I have available. And I'm really going to go get more resources. I'm going to go get different resources. I'm, you know, and, and then yeah. in some ways I'll be doing the same thing. I'll be doing the best I can with the resources I have available, but my resources will change. So I'm going to change. Yeah, the perspective you're taking is very, very practical, and it's very, very from the perspective of wanting to uh, clearly help parents and children. I'm talking nerdily uh, about you know the science of it, Te technically, yeah. technically. Yeah. Um, it's a very interesting when you think about it, uh, as uh, as uh, the behavioral geneticists have shown. Um, there's a much larger proportion of it, um, which is uh, genetic similarity, um, which means. It can create that can create some interesting cycles between the child and parent because they both share similar traits. Mm -hmm. And so, if the if let's say the mother is hugely narcissistic and they have given the child genes um, that makes the child hugely narcissistic, you now have a fight between a narcissistic mother and a narcissistic child, and that creates it. In so, there's some interesting cycles emerging from the fact that they do share certain perhaps stubborn traits, you know, from both both sides. I think again, it's why, like bringing intentionality or being a yes. cycle breaker in parenting it's like when people say oh it's hard work they're not like saying that as a throwaway like it's it's really it's really hard work <laughs> it really is and this actually segues nicely into i really love this next principle well it's a mode uh, the two things are true mode um well i love that because i love thinking in terms of dialecticals i love thinking in terms of 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 seemingly opposite things that we can integrate together yeah. so that's well i'm all about that so um so yeah so we can hold all these things we're saying as true at the same time right so yes it may be true that there's um a significant overlap of uh, uh of traits between parent child but there also is true that uh that the parent can be very intentional about um how they regulate their own traits and the way that they respond to their child right and the etc cetera, etc cetera, et cetera. so can you elaborate a little bit more on how the two things are true mode can really help parents with their parenting yeah i mean i think the idea of two things are true can help all of us in every single area of life because so often when we're really frozen in something right we're stuck ourselves or 
being in a power struggle with someone is like a version of being frozen. We're usually in like a one thing is true mode where it feels like, oh, me and my partner are like anything. Like he wants to go to his parents for the holiday. I want to go to my parents. And like, it feels like we can't, like, we can't even talk about it probably because like we each are defending something singular. And yeah, I think this happens all the time in parenting and it happens, you know, relative to what we were talking about before. Like, wait, so if I say to my kid, oh, you're so mad at your sister, like, it's okay that he hit her. Like, I'm always like, wait, whoa, like, no, how did we get there? Like, two things are true. I will not let you hit. And I get that you're mad. Let's find another way for you to express that feeling, right? And we have such a way of narrowing our perspective, right? And I think it's because, like, when all of us in our early wiring, like, most adults I know would say, yeah, when I was having a hard time, like, I was definitely looked at as a bad kid. Like nobody saw that I was struggling. Nobody saw that I was a good kid having a hard time, that my behavior was separate from our identity. And so we've been really raised and brought up and wired with a one thing is true mentality. Like whatever I see on the surface is the entire truth, right? Like that's it. And so I think like an example of two things are true that I hear over and over there that I give over and over that I think is compelling is like, let's say your kid wants to watch another TV show and you've decided like TV time is over, right? If I'm in one thing is true mentality, I probably say something like this. You're being so difficult. You know, what's wrong with you? We said two shows, right? And then my kid is like, I want to watch another one. It's just like a disaster. Okay. Or I see my kid is upset and I'm like, oh, I'm a, I'm a parent who really cares about her kid's feelings. Like, okay, okay. I guess you could watch another show. Two things are true would look like this. Hey, I want to let you know my answer is no. TV time is over. And look, like I get you're pretty upset about that. Like I also wouldn't like someone else telling me I can't watch another show. And then some version of like, you're allowed to be mad and I'm allowed to stick to my no, right? Because, and if I get there, it comes from a place of, wait, like I have the right to make a decision and Mm -hmm my kid has a right to have their feelings, right? Mm. And their feelings don't dictate my decision, but also my decision doesn't dictate their feelings. Yes. Yes, this is brilliant. (laughs) This is brilliant. This is, uh, um, I see why they call you the the Instagram parenting whisperer. (laughs) I don't know if anyone actually calls me that, but (laughs) only my husband when I make him. (laughs) <laughs> did, did you see that article though of about course. you? Yes, it's it's follow. Oh there, there's god. worse. There's worse titles that could follow me around. Yes. No. Uh- oh my god, <laughs> this is so funny. Yeah. Yeah. No. This is this is really uh really great stuff. Um. Do you ever follow just for fun like the uh, prior generations uh parenting advice people like Doctor was this Doctor Spock? No, Doc. Is that right? There's Dr. No, Dr. Spock. There's Dr. Carp. Yeah, Dr. Spock. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm not as familiar with Dr. Spock's like uh um like actual, you know, kind of writing. Um, but mm. Dr. Carp, like when I was a parent, yeah. you know, like, oh my God, like that was like my Bible, like the five S's. You know, I actually got to talk to him however many months ago is like a real, <laughs> you know, a real treat. Um yeah, like Margaret Mahler's book about the psychological life of an infant. Like, you know, that was like a big, I remember reading in my grad school. So sure, for sure. That's, you know, stuff. I, I also read the stuff as a parent, right? Those are like the Brazelton, right? All the Brazelton books around development. So yeah, certainly, you know, a lot of people to learn from. Yeah. Um, what's what's uh, very unique about your approach is uh, it, it seems like everything kind of pivots around uh, the idea of connection. Um, how to increase a high quality connection with your child in the in the parlance of positive psychology. Um, you have this one thing where you say the key element is connection after disconnection. So does that take a lot of mindfulness and a lot of intentionality to be able to kind of constantly recalibrate that? Yeah, you know, what I think about in terms of connection after disconnection, a lot of what I think about there is like repair, right? Because I think, you know, we all feel triggered by our kids. We all get exhausted. We all say things that we don't want to say. And then often what happens is a parent goes into like a shame spiral. I'm a horrible parent, you know? And then we don't go back to talk about it with our kid, usually because we just don't want to like face and feel the feelings around the reality of, you know, the thing we weren't proud of. And yet that moment of disconnection with our kid like really lives in their body and it just kind of free floats around. It's like, oh, that really didn't feel good. And nobody 
talk to me about that. And I always feel like when kids are left to their own devices to cope with hard things, they generally rely on self-doubt and self-blame, which are not things we want to wire into our kids for adulthood. They're not terribly adapted later on, right? Um, yeah. And so I always think with repair, number one, we have to repair with ourselves first. Like you can't repair with kid before in some ways you find your feet on the ground or you're sitting in a bathroom or you're, you know, sitting, I don't know, in a chair. And essentially you do find your internal goodness under your latest not so great behavior. I was a good parent having a hard time, not a bad parent doing bad things. Like we have to do that. Or I always think, I always like put my hand on my heart and kind of remind myself like, I'm not proud of that behavior. Like I feel guilty. And like that, that guilt is not a sign of a horrible person. That guilt is actually telling me I acted not in line with my values. And I actually have an opportunity to now to like act in line with my values. So and then when you repair with your kid, which is some version of going back and saying that wasn't your fault <laughs> and you don't make me yell, you don't make me say mean things. And you could also say, it depends on the situation, your kid, but like, hey, the thing that you did, look, we both know that wasn't okay and we need to work on that and we will. And that doesn't justify the thing I said, or that doesn't, right? That's, that's what's really key. And some version of I'm sorry, and I'm going to work on that. And if you're really, you know, want to go for bonus points, like, that probably felt scary to you. And I'm open to hearing more about what that was like. And what you're doing then in that moment is you're literally like reopening that file that was stored in their body with by fear and, you know, um, abandonment, you know, worry and, you know, their own spiral of kind of dark feelings. And you really reopen it. And I always think it's like the most hopeful thing. Like you get to change the ending to that story. Like you actually do. And you get to add all the elements that were missing. And that, that really makes a huge difference for a kid and for an adult and for your relationship. Yeah, definitely. You So you have children? I have children, yeah. 10, 7, and 5. That's their ages. Okay, so you have th- three children. Um, and uh, do you did you find you became more interested in this topic after having children? Um, 100%. <laughs> like, where were you yeah. 10 years ago? Yeah. 100%. You know, I've always found... You know, I've always found people interesting and I've always found systems interesting. Like I've always wanted to learn more about someone who I'm seeing in private practice or someone I was working with. I always wanted to know more about their system. What was their system growing up? What's the system they're in now? Mm. The small family system, sure. the larger systems. And so and then when I had a kid, obviously I became more interested in parenting. And then I think honestly it was when I had my second, my daughter, where I was like, oh, like different kids really do need different things. Or like, oh, when parents would say to me, like, I'm doing the thing you said, but my kid is reacting in this way. And I would kind of think in the back of my head, like, oh, I wonder if you're like doing it right. Because when I do that with my son, you know, like he responds in kind. And then I had my daughter and I was like, oh, okay. Like I, now I've lived it. Um, And so I think, you know, with my three kids, seeing how different they are, like, and yet also seeing how like when you do figure out a way of connecting to them, how powerful it is in some ways, like how powerful it is for yourself. Because like, I feel like I've grown so many parts of myself and learned so much through trying to figure out my kids um, that it's hard, but definitely just the whole topic of parenting has become that much more compelling. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Who are some other people, who are some of your contemporaries uh, that you really admire um, that you'd also recommend people uh, listen to, maybe that are very complementary to your own approach? Yeah. I mean, I feel like I get so much inspiration from internal family systems. I love their books. Yeah. Um, I love Esther Perel. Like everything she says, I find so interesting. I love... A prior guest on this podcast. Amazing. Um, <laughs> I love listening to Glennon Doyle and Abby mm-hmm. Wambach's, you know, I think uh, Abby Wambach. There's so much in the good inside approach that's really about, again, like embodying your authority and setting boundaries and creating more space for yourself and feeling more embodied. And that in some ways has, quote, nothing to do with parenting, but really has everything to do with parenting because it enables you to show up in a sturdier way. Um, And so those people come to mind. I love Nedra Tawab. I love the way. Oh, I love her. Yeah. I love the way she thinks. Another prior guest. Uh, Yeah. So, um. Those are those are the people that immediately come to mind. Cool. Uh, you have written that uh, you would rather prioritize resilience over happiness for kids. Why is that an important prioritization for parents? 
So doesn't but, everyone want their child to be happy? Right. Everyone says that. Don't you just want your child to be happy? And I remember yeah. someone saying that to me. I was like, no. And again, we had this thing like, oh, it's, you want your kids to be unhappy? Like, no, definitely not unhappy either. But um, there's a lot between that and the things we also, the things we really want for our kids. I think it's always a good time to pause and just see like how much of ourselves is in there versus, you know, how much of our kid is in there. I, I kind of want my kids to, I don't know, define what they want for themselves, you know, <laughs> um, not to say I can't jump in and be controlling at times. Of course I can. Um, so why do I think resilience is a better goal? or more like empowering goal than happiness. Well, I think a lot of these thoughts came from the work I did with adults for so many years where I got a lot of these same clients, like they'd be these incredibly high achieving people on the outside, you know, the college, the partnership, the, the job, the, the everything. And like, they came in feeling like so empty and so anxious. And there were a lot of stories of the ways in which, not all of them, but a bunch of them, their, their childhoods were like, quote, perfect. They're like, I don't even know. Like, I'm supposed to talk about my childhood in therapy. Like, I don't know. My parents were always there for me, right? Um, and when we looked into it more, it seemed like there was a lot of stories of like their childhoods being really focused on like maximizing happiness at all time. So like, I didn't make the soccer team. So I, you know, I don't know. I drove to this town instead of to make that soccer team. You know, I didn't, I remember I didn't get invited to the slumber party. And I remember my parents, you know, did the slumber party for me. Right. And like on the surface, none of those things individually. It's not like I'm like, oh, I would never, I would just leave my kid in a puddle of despair. Like, again, there's a lot between extremes, but there were these patterns in which like, anytime a child was upset, they were rescued from that and like brought into happy. Like, I always think about this idea of this feelings bench. Like, I feel like kids are walking around and, like, sitting on different benches, which are different experiences and feelings. So one might be the left out bench. And I always think as a parent sitting on that bench with them, being like, hey, I'm here. You're not alone. You know, this is probably a bench you'll be on again. Or are they, like, pulling them off and bringing them to the happiness bench in the sun? And they're actually really different interventions. And if you think about the patterns – like what I don't want for my kids when they're 25 is to be scared of their own distress. Is when something inevitably happens that's upsetting, that brings them jealousy, that brings them sadness, that brings them frustration, that brings them insecurity. I want them to say some to some degree, like, I felt this feeling before. Like I know I'm gonna get through it. There's a reason I'm feeling it. There's probably even information for me in this feeling. I'm not scared of this feeling. I don't have to run away from this feeling which is also a really hard thing to do given feelings live in your body. And so resilience to me comes from the ability to like sit on any of those benches. And I also think the biggest paradox is when we help kids over their childhoods build resilience, happiness naturally finds those people because there's just more space for happy. Whereas when we focus only on happiness, happiness is actually really hard to find because anytime a distress light flickers on, it's like kind of panic and running away. Yes, yes. And let me say also, though, like, I'm not a master at this. Like, if my husband was here listening, he'd be like, you know, Becky, you have a hard time tolerating distress sometimes, you know? Like, you can, like, look for the happy. And I'm always like, yeah, why do you think I write about it all the time? Like, this is, like, my own <laughs> therapy. So, like, I think it's really easy to think, like, for other people, like, oh, Becky has this thing figured out. Or people say this to me all the time. Like, I describe a scenario, and they're like, oh, my goodness, do you have a camera inside my home? Like, how did you know what's happening in my home? And I was like, that would be a very complicated thing. Like, it's interesting to me that you just didn't assume that probably that scenario, like, happened in my home, right? Like, my home is probably like your home. So all of these things, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm just very much a student of them, too. That's all. No, oh, of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, shame is a, a big one, um, a, a big emotion that a lot of people run away from. Um, or that prevents people from approaching, at least. Um, so how can people detect and reduce shame, uh, parents as well as uh, children that are feeling shameful for a behavior they did? It works both directions, right? A hundred percent. Shame. I'm sure you know we could talk about shame it's a big forever. Topic. It's a big topic. topic. Yeah, so, I know. You know, the way I think about shame, which I don't think is like anything novel, is... I think like the active experience of shame, especially as adults, is like a feeling of like a perceived break in connection, a perceived break in attachment. And shame gets built over time for kids when they go through experiences where they believe entire like kind of parts of them 
are non-conducive with attachment. Kind of like this thing, this part of me who just did this thing, who's feeling this way. Nobody wants to be around him. Nobody wants to be around her. She gets distance, not connection. She gets punishment, not curiosity. She gets, you know, the, the dark eyes, not the warm eyes. And then again, because kids are always trying to adapt, they're like, oh, well, I better put that part of me away because my goal is to maximize attachment. That's how I get all my needs met. I'm dependent on my parents for a very long time. And so I better put that part like deep down in a closet. Like I really, really better put that part away. And yet I think it goes back to some of the other things we're talking about and why I think differentiating between identity and behavior is so important. Because for example, let's say, um, I don't know, I, let's say I'm with my kid at a birthday party and they're really, really hesitant. It seems like, you know, they're the only one who's not joining, right? So what is wrong with you? You're embarrassing me. You're embarrassing me. Or later I was like, you were the, you made it, you're so dramatic. Like, you know, all those kids, you know, all those kids, like, why do you have to be the only one, right? Why is that shame inducing? Because what a kid really learns is when I'm nervous and hesitant, I'm not lovable. I'm not connectable. I'm not attachable, right? Versus, and this is, and it's again, like the paradox here is so interesting because then the part that was nervous and hesitant has now shame layered on. Well, shame brings on like an animal freeze defense state, right? So now if you think about changing, like, I don't think anyone would say an important ingredient in change is like frozenness, like getting frozen in something like is inherently oppositional to change, right? So versus let's say I'm at the party and I say to my kid, like something about this party doesn't feel great to you. Like, I believe you, you'll, you'll figure it out, or I'm sure you'll join when you want something like that. Or if it's a chronic problem, maybe I talk about it with my kid in advance. Hey, what's it going to be like to be at the party? It's going to be a lot of people. Do you want to look at a picture of what the gymnastics facility is going to look like? Just so you kind of can picture it in advance. Cause I know new things can feel really tricky for me too. I, I'm just making this up. A kid is learning big lessons there, whether I'm yeah. allowed to feel hesitant. Can I trust that feeling? Can I talk to my parent about being hesitant? Well, you know, when I have a 16 year old and she's invited, I don't know, to some party and she's feeling a little hesitant, the irony is I think all of us would be like, yes, we want you to feel that way and come talk to me about it. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. And so the, I think the big thing about, mm -hmm. I think there's a couple things about shame. I think one of the things that really helps us in terms of like not bringing on shame to our kid is differentiating like a feeling from a behavior. So as long as I look at my kid as the only one not joining, okay, then like she's the kid who doesn't join. Um, I'm more likely to bring on shame. When I look at my kid as, what, what, oh, she's probably feeling hesitant. Okay. Like I can understand hesitation. Like we all feel hesitation sometimes. And it happens to be inconvenient for me because I'd rather be talking to my friends, but I can understand that. And I think differentiating feelings from behavior helps us then come up with that most generous interpretation and helps us lead with connection instead of disconnection and shame. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I clearly can see that. Um, what about uh, the value of self-care? Um, well, how can burn, burnout, exhausted parents um, make more self-care routines in their life? I mean, self-care is so important, so important. And I think, I think how do we create self-care routines, but also like what really constitutes self-care for me? Right. Because I think we're fed a lot of ideas of like what self-care is. And, and I really mean, it's like, I love a pedicure. I can't, I don't get them, you know, for many reasons as often I would like, but I love that. But like for me, that's not like, that's one version of self-care. But to me, the self-care that I see so many parents needing more of is like self-care that makes you feel empowered and like capable and like maybe excited or creative, right? Um, and yes. so I think for anyone listening, when they're thinking about self-care, just to be like, there's not one right way to do this. There's probably many different buckets. So if one is like being taken care of, okay, I like feeling taken care of. That feels like self-care. Maybe a pedicure falls into that bucket. Okay. But what other buckets, you know, do I need? Because what feelings do I have a hard time accessing? And those are probably the things I need to build. So what helps me feel empowered? What helps me feel not alone? And then in terms of like my number one tip to build a self-care routine is I think we have this fantasy sometimes as parents that like I'm going to say to my partner or my kids like I can't put you down to bed tonight because I'm going out to dinner with my friends. 
something like that. And my husband's going to say to me, you know what? You deserve that. And my kids are going to say, you deserve that, mom. We're going to all, you know, I don't know, clap as you walk out the door. We're so proud of you for taking care of ourselves, yourself. That just like doesn't happen. Often a partner will say like, oh, really? I have to put the kids down? And you're going to be like, what? You're not putting me down. And I think to really engage in self-care, we have to tolerate the distress of prioritizing ourselves. And especially for women who most of us were raised to like gaze out and take care of others, you know, way, 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 way before gazing in and taking care of ourselves. It's a totally new circuit to like really take care of yourself. And I think we can't wait for the time that like everything lines up perfectly and to start thinking again, two things are true. It's not like, oh, I feel guilty so I can't go out to dinner. It's I can go out to dinner and I can tolerate that guilty feeling. Yeah. I think a lot of um, these patterns uh, are maybe taught by their parents. Um, so what are some, you know, or maybe the kind of environments they grew up in really influenced the way that they, they raise their own children. Um, what if a parent wants to be a cycle breaker? And that's a phrase you, you use. Um, and they, they, they're like, you know what, uh, this, these intergenerational patterns, they stop right now. Um, what, how can they, how can they have the yeah. courage to do that? I think that that's the, that takes a lot of courage. So what I would say about being a cycle breaker is first of all, Cycle breaking doesn't mean doing a 180, right? Like, I don't know anyone who does a 180 in anything except, you know, like, so, you know, someone was saying like my, you know, my childhood was just full of being yelled at and sent to my room. And I want to be the parent. It's like calm and connected because I actually want to have a relationship with my kids when they get old, right? I'm like, that's amazing. I remember this, my private practice, the guilt, like I yelled at my kids and I was like, you, you think you're going to go from a childhood where you were yelled at all the time to your kids having a childhood where they're never yelled at? Like, I, I wasn't yelled at that much as a kid. I still yell at my kids. And I'm not saying that like with a badge of honor, but it's just practical. So if you're a parent who's identifying as a cycle breaker, I would even imagine like the starting point and remind yourself, not only like, do I not need to go? I like, it's not realistic to do a complete shift on that. And so to set a goal, that's still so momentous and so huge, but also allows yourself to like feel good about this huge effort, right? So it might be a setting a goal first of like, I promise myself this week that I'm going to repair with my kids when I do yell. That's still a big difference because what I know is most people who are yelled at all the time, there wasn't any repair. That's a big difference. Okay. My goal the next week is I would like to find one time this week when I feel that urge to scream and I recognize it early and I say to my kids, hey, this is one of those times we talked about where I need a moment. I'm going to go take some deep breaths in my room and I'll be back once, 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 one time, right? That is cycle breaking right there. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Becky, for being on my podcast today. Good luck with your book, which is called Good Inside. And for everyone listening, um, check out her amazing Instagram page, Dr. Becky at Good Inside is the name of your Instagram handle. I just Googled it. Um, it's such a pleasure and honor to have you on the Psychology Podcast today. Thank you so much. Uh, really, really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.